Cosplay, competition, performance, judging. Unlike craftsmanship pre-judging, which happens with you in the room and gives you a lot of information to glean on how you will be judged in the competition, you will not get the chance to talk to your performance judges before the performance. And that can make the performance judging rather mysterious. But today we, and I do mean we, because it's not just me here today. <laughs> Today, Mink and I are going to unravel those mysteries for you and talk about exactly what goes on behind the scenes when judges go through and nitpick every single performance and decide which one wins best in show. Hey, hey folks, my name is Mad Dog and I run this little cosplay channel, Telekinetic Maniac. And to be blunt, I am not entirely qualified to speak on cosplay performance judging. My personal experiences with cosplay performance are mostly limited to fashion show walk-ons for craftsmanship only competitions with a couple of like Halloween one-liner skits thrown in there. <laughs> and that one year in ICMB I did like way long ago with my friends. <laughs> Well, I have seen a lot of masquerades, and I've watched the whole start to finish process of my friends competing in performance competitions many times. And I do have experience being a craftsmanship judge, so I've had the privilege of sitting at the judges' table and like hearing everything that the performance judges have to say. I don't think it's fair for you to hear only my takes in this video. So today it is my absolute delight to welcome our very special guest, Mink the Seder. Hi friends, I'm Mink the Seder. I'm a fellow cosplayer and performance judge. I specialize in Pokemon cosplay, which is to say, I redesign animal-like creatures into human form fashion. <laughs> I consider myself a jack of all trades in the crafting circuit. I'm most comfortable with sewing and leather working. However, I do a lot of EVA foam work and resin casting. I've been a cosplay and performance judge for a little over five years now, and it's pretty great to be on the other side of the stage so I can watch my fellow crafters express themselves and do victory laps to show off their beautiful work. Can we please appreciate the performance that she's putting in with that outfit? I'm losing my mind. <laughs> Mink is a wonderful craftsperson, wonderful performer, and overall wonderful person. I've had the honor of seeing her perform live, uh, seeing her work up close, and just getting to actually talk to her. She is a total bean, very involved with the local convention community and the much larger overarching cosplay community as well. And I gotta stop myself before I go on all day about her, but you should totally check out her work at Mink the Seder on these many platforms. <laughs> and also totally give her a follow. Her work is not to be missed. Alrighty, timestamps are in the description. You know the drill, let's go. <laughs> Gone are the days of conventions having casual cosplay competitions where you show up at the con, fill out a slip, and then shout a catchphrase when they call your name. Well, these aren't completely gone. Some conventions, especially smaller local conventions, may have some casual competitions still. And even some larger conventions may allow a certain number of same-day walk-ons into their competitions. But overall, cosplay competitions have developed into a much grander main stage event. And if you want to participate, you need to be prepared for that. Generally speaking, you need to apply in advance at a certain level and for a certain category or categories. And then do not an insignificant amount of prep work for what you're competing in while waiting to find out if you've even been accepted into the competition. Fingers crossed that theoretical you will be. When applying for performance, I want to reiterate what I said last week in my craftsmanship judging video. Make sure that you read the rules. <laughs> the rules are everything because every competition is different and they will dictate exactly what your correlating competition requires and what you will need to do to prepare for it. So read the rules. <laughs> However, the performance that you sign up for will probably fall into one of three categories, either because the rules dictate it as such or because you choose it to be the best for what you want to do. So it's best you understand what they entail. These categories are fashion show walk-on, where you literally walk on and strike one single pose, a true timed walk-on, which is a lot more than just the one pose, and a full length skit, which is even more than that. <laughs> My ethos is that performance is 75% preparedness and 25% like actual performing. So as a costumer, you've already done the hardest part, which is making the costume. So this performance really should just be your victory lap, your celebration of all of the crazy hard work you've done. So with just like a little bit of pre-planning, you can absolutely crush it. Let's start with the walk-ons. 
you can generally anticipate a smaller or newer convention as having a walk-on competition. They're the quickest of the cosplay showcases and typically don't require a whole lot of space or time demands for the convention staff. So for example, there isn't like a need for a green room or a holding zone for the participants in a walk-on competition. It's also been my experience that these competitions have some sort of audience vote or throat vote associated with it, but not always. To me, these are actually the most challenging of the performances. As a competitor, you've such a limited time to leave the audience with the impact of your costume. Trying to summarize an entire character and their vibe in just a single utterance at the mic is very daunting, especially if you're someone like me who likes to cosplay Pokemon, who are famously known for only saying their name. That would be like, Taurus. <laughs> so let's just say I've totally blown it when it comes to the walk-ons. My advice for people doing this kind of competition is to have a pre-planned line and pose ready in mind. So really look at yourself in the mirror. Practice it beforehand. I've done poses in the mirror that in my head looked cool, but it definitely needed work when I took it to the mirror. A true timed walk-on is usually... 30 to 90 seconds on the stage. Now, I know that sounds like barely any time, but if you could just take a timer and silently sit there for 30 to 90 seconds, you realize it could be an absolute eternity on stage. But hey, glass half full moment, that means that the stage is definitely yours to command for that length of time. So in some competitions, they'll let you bring in music to accompany your walk-on, and that is so key. For those kinds of walk-ons, I find it's best if you figure out a character trope and just try to embody it. A lot of characters we cosplay are complex and multidimensional, and they have a complicated range of emotions. And, but when you're on stage, you're revealing your character to people who might not be familiar with what you're cosplaying. When I don't recognize a character as a judge, I really rely on the walk-on performance to give me a sense of who they are. I wouldn't expect to see like a Zuko character from Avatar bouncing around like a fluffy cupcake. <laughs> so my advice for people doing a timed walk-on would be to first see if you can provide music for the competition because music is just a great way to set the tone for your character and you can do a lot with it once you're on stage. If music isn't an option, then in advance think of like three to five poses that can work with your character that shows off your costume. Mentally divide up the stage into like thirds or fourths or fifths and be sure to walk to each mark and hit those poses. <laughs> It'll look cool. And more importantly, you'll look confident. If you can bring music, it's an opportunity for you to sync your movements to the beat or in key parts of the song. Uh, for my Zuko example, here's a cool opportunity to match martial arts inspired poses to punch parts of the song and really highlight your movements. Believe me, it really does look cool in the audience and the judges really enjoy it. So jumping over to performances in which you're given the opportunity to make skits, well, that is a lot, and there's a lot to be covered. I'd say this is the real meat of what Mad Dog and I are covering today. How to create a good performance is the real kicker. I can't tell you there's a specific formula that you can just do X, Y, Z, and bam, amazing, award-winning performance, flowers, chocolates, awards, whatever. But I can tell you that a decisive, developed idea tends to look better on stage. So when you're planning a skit or a dance or a martial art demonstration or whatever, I strongly recommend that you have a storytelling goal in mind. It can be really simple. Uh, two characters bump into each other and they misperceive the bumping in as an offensive slight. <gasps> and then battling ensues. I know I love skits in which there is a subversive element or like a little surprise at the end. It can be dramatic, it can be funny. It, I just like being surprised. and. An audience member doesn't like a little surprise, you know? That reminds me, more than thinking about what the judges want, you should really be thinking about what will make the audience happy. When you are in a uh, performance competition, you want to prioritize the audience. You want to make sure that they're having a good time and you make a good impact. So even if the judges don't ultimately hand you an award, like there's a wonderful feeling that comes with being well received by your audience. I love that. 
The idea of prioritizing the audience and giving them a little surprise is so strong. As someone who's always sitting in the audience, I have to say that the performances that utilize this idea are the ones that I both enjoy the most and are the most memorable to me. And remember, it's not just me in the audience. The judges are there too, experiencing the same thing and reacting similarly. Quick tip, if you are nervous about performing or coming up with a concept, like this all just seems so overwhelming, participation in the fashion show can be a great stepping stone for participation in the true walk-on category. And likewise, walk-ons can be a great stepping stone for full-length skits. If you think you might need those stepping stones before you're ready to compete with a whole full-length skit, Use them to your advantage. What judges look for in a performance will vary on the type of performance that you give. For example, if you're just doing a fashion show pose after already having done your craftsmanship pre-judging, unless your costume literally falls to pieces on stage, <laughs> proving that you should not be in the running for an award, <laughs> it's probably going to have no impact on you at all. The main focus for a craftsmanship-based contest is the craftsmanship, and the performance you give on stage just won't have anything to do with your score. However, if you do a true walk-on or a full-length skit, some things to look out for are how successfully you're performing on stage, how well that comes across to the audience, and your actual production value. And yes, I did just say production value. <laughs> Even if you made nothing used in your performance, not the costume, not the props, nothing, just because your competition doesn't require it. These things should still be effective on stage because masquerades are cosplay competitions. People are here to see your costumes, even if you didn't necessarily make yours from scratch. So don't forget to think about things like how well your costume moves on stage, if your audio is timed correctly, etc. because they will be brought up when the judges deliberate. Mad Dog is exactly right. The way your costume moves and is showcased is always the most important thing that I look for when I'm a performance judge. That's the ethos of why we are watching you in the first place. So if your costume has cool features, I want to see them. This is your opportunity to do what I call the show-stopping moment. As a competitor, I like to plan my competition costume uh, around the idea of like, can I do something cool during my performance that makes the audience go, whoa! Uh, those show-stopping moments can be simple or elaborate, but it's a good idea to think about in advance. I've seen people make transforming costumes, uh, like spreading their wings, doing feats of acrobatics, the list really does go on. To the extent that you can plan an audience gasping, oh, clutching moment in your performance, I definitely encourage you to do so. I also know that I've talked a little bit already about music and getting your timing synced when it comes to walk-ons. What I didn't bring up is the pre-recorded audio mixing. <laughs> Some competitions outright refuse to allow participants to use any live microphone setup. So the only way to do a skit that has dialogue in it is to have pre-recorded audio that you've mixed yourself. That means you can really go crazy with audio storytelling. I've seen people mix music, dialogue, and sound effects to create these like amazing sound samples that could stand alone just by themselves. The hard part though is then pairing your body's movements to these audio cues. And the solution really is kind of a boring one. It's just practice. I know it seems obvious, but you can really tell the difference between folks who practice their skits and nail every mark versus people who haven't. There's nothing more satisfying to watch than a performer who hits every mark. The punchline to a joke can really be that much funnier with a well-timed, real precision of movement. If you have multiple people on stage at once, practice in and out of cosplay is so important. You gotta really make sure you know how to move in your sometimes restrictive costumes, especially to make that audio track match. Definitely choreography, so it is work, but it's like fun work, so yay. In the same vein as music is also lighting. Some conventions that focus on the performance element in their competitions will also have these like tech time slots rather than having like a craftsmanship pre-judging slot. So that's your opportunity to be the director. Uh, sadly, when I was new to the competition scene, I um, kind of squandered this opportunity. I basically just gave him my music and was like, that's all you need. See you later. Um, don't do that. <laughs> if you're given tech time, I recommend, yes, troubleshoot your music and your props and your stagecraft. 
you know, if you get brought in any set pieces. But definitely I recommend considering lighting. If you're not familiar with lighting effects, this is a good opportunity to ask the tech crew for the convention if they've got any suggestions for how to make your moment more dramatic or how to feature a particular character during your performance and so on. I've gotten actually really excellent results from these collaborations because by no means am I an expert in you know, lighting or sound. So let the experts help you. And once again, it really does enhance your performance and it just brings your quality up that higher notch. Wow, these nitty gritty details are incredible and things that I wouldn't necessarily think of as a mostly non-performer. But looking back on all my experiences in the audience, Mink is on the nose. These are all things that really improve the quality of any performance and make it accessible to the audience. Like, oh my gosh, imagine if you didn't do your audio and like the audience just couldn't even hear a single thing you said. And are exactly what the judges look for when they single out their choices for standout competitors. However, while all these things are wonderful, don't forget what Mink said originally about creating a good performance. Even if you don't have the opportunity to use all these wonderful things to your advantage, prioritizing the audience and having that little surprise will not go unnoticed. So, having now talked about what goes into a good performance as a whole, how can performances and performance judging differ depending on what category you enter into? I'm gonna be 100% honest with you. Novice, journeyman, and master categories for performance are very subjective. <laughs> These categories are a little bit easier to perceive the differences in when you're talking about costume construction and quality, because a lot of times it's just like based on experience. However, when you're talking about performance, I've seen novice division cosplay craftsmanship absolutely destroy it and the performance category to the point where you really have to think of them as master level performers. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I think what really separates the categories in performance are preparedness and comfort on stage. You can have the most intricate and beautiful costume in the show. But if you aren't comfortable on the stage, you might be limiting your scores with the judges, if that's important to you. Because performance judging is so subjective, I think that remark about preparedness and comfort on stage really sums it up. Commenters, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of performers really tend to struggle with what category to even place themselves into when competing in performance. With crafting, you can kind of see you've mastered techniques and move up in the ranks. But with performance, how do you gauge that sort of mastery? Provided you aren't like disqualified from any category due to like past awards and such. I think that this idea of preparedness and comfort should really be how you gauge your work and decide what to enter into. There may be times when you write a skit and you think it's wonderful and your specific audience just doesn't get it. Performance really is subjective, but that doesn't mean you should stay a novice for forever. Think critically about your comfort and your ability to put on a show and enter accordingly. And a quick side note, there is like one big difference in categories, usually. Your category will more than likely affect how much time you are given on stage to perform. Novices get less time while masters get a whole lot of time. Don't underestimate the amount of time you're given in any category though. <laughs> Cause honestly, even that one fashion pose walk on time can last an eternity while you're up there. But yeah, time. So I'm gonna think about when we're getting on a piece. To finish off this video, Mink and I have a couple other quick tips for you that didn't quite fit into one of our overall categories, but are still so important. So here goes. <laughs> Don't point your projectiles at the audience. This is really boring to say, but paramount when applicable, especially here in the United States. Just, just don't do it. Don't give audience members panic attacks. Don't give staff panic attacks. Don't be unceremoniously shuffled off stage and asked not to return. People hope that your prop is a prop, but people seeing it from afar don't know that for certain. So just don't be that guy. Also like, even if there weren't any fear that your prop might not be a prop, it's just not a good performance anyway. Like staring down the barrel of that like, prop gun only really shows the audience that little, little circle. We really want to see the side silhouette anyway, so just, just show off your prop from the side. Don't bring anything on stage that you can't take off the stage quickly. So that includes things like flower petals or confetti for some random non-specific examples. <laughs> Leaving particulate 
on the stage is disrespectful both to the stagehands and to the performers who come on after you. And for those folks, it can be uh, trip hazards. <laughs> and you certainly don't want to sabotage your fellow competitors. If you are performing a conversation as part of your skit, turn three quarters, not fully sideways. The audience will be able to see your costume and your face better if you're on a three quarter turn and it will still look like you're talking to your stage partner. To that end, the other suggestion I have is exaggerate your expressions. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. Like really sell it. That back row cannot see you fake cry. Ham it up for the back row. They will appreciate you. If you genuinely have no idea where to start, consider doing something funny. People thrive off of high energy and just good fun when attending live performances like masquerades. Super big piece of advice, highlight time. If you mess up, keep going. Try not to let it show that you messed up. The audience does not know your choreography, but they will know you messed up if your face and body suddenly give up and you act frustrated with yourself. We know, you guys know what it looks like. We've all seen our nieces and nephews in their kindergarten school play. Someone forgets a line and then everyone goes like this. Don't be the kindergarten niece and nephew. All right, but say you are really, really in the weeds. You have absolutely 100% messed up. There is no recovery. Oh gosh, what do I do? Just smile bright and take a bath. <laughs> Sometimes things go super duper wrong and there is just no hiding from it. But if you look happy and if you are bright and cheery, the audience will cheer for you all the harder for your positivity. So go for it. Just be like, yeah, thank you for your consideration. Peace. <laughs> Fam, that is it from Mink and I for this week. Please do check out her work and her upcoming events, and please give her a follow as thanks for all of her wonderful insight. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to seeing some New England cosplay locals at the upcoming Aresia and Captain Con conventions, where I'm gonna be uh, guest judges at both of those cons. If you're interested in catching more of my adventures, I encourage you to check out my links um, I am Mink the Seder on most social media platforms, so I make it pretty easy. I'm currently actually working on an Italian Renaissance gown that's inspired by a cryptid, and it has a fun transforming element. So keep popping into my links to see how that develops. I know I'm being a little secretive right now, but I promise you it will be worth it. <laughs> I am also a VTube streamer, so, you know, if you're interested in intrigued in watching an animated version of me playing games and making art, then you can catch me over on um, Twitch as well, okay? <laughs> Literally such a bead, such a pleasure to work with. Please go appreciate her and all of her amazing work. Tune in next week for another video about cosplay competitions, because I will be talking about cosplay competitions all January long. Although, unfortunately, not with Mink R.I.P. And if you missed last week's video where I talk about craftsmanship pre-judging, check it the heck out! <laughs> These two videos about judging kind of go hand in hand, so if you're a competitor or you want to be one, both subjects are really important to learn about. Especially if you're, like, still trying to discern which category or categories you want to compete in. If you liked this video, please give it a like. Help YouTube figure out what I make videos about once and for all. It is- it's just a cosplay channel, YouTube. It's just cosplay. And until next time, Mink and I will see you this weekend on the Aresia 2023 con floor. We're both judging. I really hope that I finish my new judge's cosplay. <laughs>